Tai Chi, movements that have been practiced for centuries. They prompt thoughts of dance, meditation, tranquility. People study this art because of its benefits to health, both for the mind and the body. It is a gentle technique that promotes circulation of our vital energies. The birthplace of this practice is China, and it is part of a rich and diverse spiritual tradition called Taoism. In terms of the three great teachings of China, Confucianism teaches wisdom. Buddhism focuses on nirvana, and Taoists talk about the method of training or the path. The method of training or the path are embodied in this familiar symbol. In it, there's movement as well, two halves flowing in balance, an equilibrium to be strived for. Simply stated, the symbol evokes harmony. It is an expression of Taoism, one of the world's oldest faith traditions. The origins of Taoist thought are found in China's ancient history. During the 6th century BC, a great philosopher called Lao Tzu emerged. He suggested people can attain harmony in life by following the Tao, the path or the way. Lao Tzu recorded his thoughts in a mystical poem of 5,000 pictograms called Tao Te Ching, the book of the way and its virtue. The Tao is empty. It is used but never filled. It dulls sharp edges, unties knots, softens glares, and settles the dust. Its depths are hidden yet eternal. I do not know from where it comes. It seems to precede nature. Six centuries after Lao Tzu, a man called Cheung Tao Ling developed Taoism into a religious practice. He combined the thinking behind texts, such as the Tao Te Ching, and ancient shamanistic rituals to establish the first religion native to China. All things come from the Tao, the Tao which is the way of nature, but also the origin of all things, the true source of all things. We could call it God, but uh, Taoists do not usually speak of uh, this principle in a personal way. Taoist rituals remain seldom seen outside the Chinese community, but important Taoist texts are available. Lao Tzu's inspiring work, the Tao Te Ching, is the second most translated book in the world. I think for good reason people find those books speak to them in certain ways. They, they propose a kind of uh, gentle approach to life, a harmonious approach to living that many is resonant for many people. There's an ecological a thread to Taoism that's also res resonant for us today. What I think is less common and less available to people are these rituals and ceremonies and the temple tradition has not been as widely dispersed in Western culture.
Taoist temples are traditionally learning centers for Taoist practice. They're open to the community, not isolated monasteries. Temples provide a diverse set of teachings grouped together in three broad methods of practice that Taoists call the Three Vehicles. The first vehicle focuses on doing good deeds. The second is ritual ceremonies. And the third vehicle embraces techniques and postures that are called internal alchemy. Since I was a graduate student in uh, theology, and in particular in Christian spirituality, I was already quite aware that the Taoist tradition uh, offered something very special. As I continued my Tai Chi practice, I became more aware that this art represented a very special opportunity to learn more about the Taoist tradition. Taoist training offered a first-hand opportunity to be involved in a rich spiritual tradition. So gong chi chi pai guai wai pai guai wai chi chi gun fa so gun fa so chi I think anybody is a Taoist who follows that path. If, if you consider yourself to be walking the path, because of course one of the meanings of Tao is the way or the path, and if you see yourself as walking on that path, then, then I guess you're a Taoist. It's not that you have to say, I believe in the Tao or in Taoism, but it's that that's a practice that informs the way you live your life. Uh, how can I recognize one? Do they have different haircuts? Or <laughs> No, I think in a way that's, uh, that Taoism is very internal. It's, it's very much a part of your perspective on life and your perspective on the world. In Taoism, we always say, be natural. Every person should progress at his or her own pace. One goal of Taoist practice is to be quiet, to find stillness and not to be dispersed. In all temples, those who come shall not be refused, and those who want to leave shall not be held back. Well, the idea of the three vehicles, I think, is a, a really convenient way for understanding that the path of Taoism is a, is a multiple path. It has lots of branches and lots of ways that people can cultivate themselves or can practice, put the Taoist ideas into practice. So that when you think about the what's sometimes called the lower vehicle, it is that very practical approach to everyday living, doing good deeds, helping other people. It's a nice guide to everyday living that is very resonant with a lot of other traditions, re religious and spiritual traditions too. The second vehicle, um, the middle vehicle, is the, the, the path of the rituals and the ceremonies. And personally, I, I respond warmly to that when I, I study drama and theater, and I find that, again, it's an aspect of Western life that it's kind of lacking very often. Um, I, I grew up in the Protestant tradition where there wasn't a very ritualized religious practice. And, As I understand it, his third vehicle, or the, sometimes called the higher vehicle, 
It's probably the most arduous path of Taoist training because it involves a real physical and mental or spiritual transformation. The theory of internal alchemy really has to do with working with the, the natural energies of the body. The third vehicle's most common forms of expression are meditation and Tai Chi. The mind and body exercise together to cultivate good health. The middle vehicle, the second avenue of Taoist practice, is ritual ceremony. Often modeled on the ways of the imperial court of China, these practices express Taoist teachings. Mysterious, at times deeply revealing to their practitioners, the ceremonies are a distillation of thousands of years of Chinese culture. This is the, 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 all the lamps made up the Chinese character jade, so for the jade emperor. Huh? So this is the title for the jade emperor there. So, and, and that's the 24 lamps, uh, 24 lights in, in this ceremony. So it's, so it's the light, the light of blessings to shine on everybody. Everybody is healthy, everybody is uh, at peace, peace in, and harmony in the world. <laughs> The Jade Emperor, chief deity in religious Taoism, is not at all God the Creator, as in Christianity, for example. Rather, he is an all-powerful administrator of the large and elaborate Taoist universe, able to influence all that happens in heaven and on earth. And that's where he gets the association, too, as the one who keeps the records on the good deeds of humanity right. that the guardian reports to the Jade Emperor, and then if you That's do right. good you deeds, years are added to your life. If you do bad deeds, years are taken away. So the guardian, the guardian reports right. to the Jade Emperor. That's right. That's okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's right. And, and then the kitchen, you know, in the home com uh, counterpart of that would be your kitchen guard. The kitchen gods also report to the Jade Emperor. Oh, I see. I see. So you get reported on in, in your career life, That's and right. you get reported on in your domestic life. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. Trouble here. <laughs> so they don't miss a trick. <laughs> the Jade Emperor and his subordinates, the Guardian of the Tao and the Kitchen God, are among the most common figures in the Taoist pantheon. In popular belief, deities such as these govern heaven and earth. In a deeper understanding of Taoism, these various deities embody important teachings such as virtue, wisdom, or compassion. Many Chinese dedicate themselves to a particular deity by paying homage to them while asking to receive the teachings they represent. In the purely Taoist or religious sense, I guess, uh, all the great teachers, the sage and the teachers, are really reincarnations or rebirth of uh, deities or important heavenly lords that comes down. And of course, uh, if they were to return again in the future, then there should be the environment available for, like, for them there. The temple is there so that they can have their teachings uh, and then they can in turn spread the teachings through the temple. Many ceremonies evoke teaching processes. This particular one is directed to those who have died, 
but its compassionate approach can also be interpreted as a metaphor for all Taoist training. Priests call the deities down to heal ailing spirits. Those who have died in pain, in sickness or from accidents such as flood or fire, have souls that are unbalanced. They cannot find the path, the way. The deities go amongst these lost souls like doctors from heaven. The spirits are instructed, advised to be compassionate, and given the techniques to find harmony. Once healed, the spirits are sent away so they can return to the Tao. In the Taoist pursuit of harmony, the three vehicles often intertwine, overlapping so that practice, ritual, and good deeds become one and the same. In the Taoist tradition, there is a very balanced training that is offered between cultivating both the mind or the intellect and the body, and that uh, really spirituality is rooted in the health of the body. For those who are involved in the rituals and the ceremonies, the focus is more on an internal type of training, a more meditative training. The rituals themselves often represent a certain kind of qigong, uh, the art of circulating internal energy, uh, working towards transforming the uh, systems in the body to a much healthier state. And so the signs and symbols around the shrine are designed to remind us uh, of the goals of our training. The purpose of Taoist training is to cultivate health. This transformation to good health is achieved through various techniques that are jointly called internal alchemy, the third vehicle of Taoist practice. Chanting is one of the few times when you actually work directly on breathing. As you chant, as you kind of sing out the sounds of the different scriptures, you are really using, trying to breathe from the diaphragm and actually open up that part of the body, the chest, the lungs, that, that whole area. By making the various precise syllables of the words of the chants, you're exercising all of the points in the face and the jaw, letting the jaw muscles work. And the throat is also getting exercised with the vibrations from the chanting and so on. the pace and just let it out instead of trying to hold it in and drag it long. Yeah. You think we should uh, do this some more or should we move on to Dai Bei Zhao? Dai Bei Zhao. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ambitious, ambitious group, eh? <laughs> Taoist is renowned for its uh, study of a nurturing life and from that came the internal alchemy. Uh, it really is, uh, again, the knowledge from many, many generations of masters. I guess the earliest text dates back to over 2,000 years ago that someone describing stages of transformation and changes within the body. But returning to origin doesn't mean just on a spiritual or mental level, but it can literally mean on a physical level. Uh, one example that we can use is that the 
the body of a, of a baby just at the moment before he or she leaves the mother's womb. That, at that stage, the body is, a, I guess, is a, almost a completely enclosed entity where circulation is running within and is uh, just feeding on itself. And uh, that, that is, uh, we consider that as the, almost the body of the perfect health. And that is the stage that we want to return to. Of course, there are many, many techniques, uh, be it uh, moving exercises like the Tai Chi and uh, various uh, external exercises, and be it with the stillness exercises like the sitting meditation. When I started Tai Chi, I was just looking for an exercise that I wouldn't get tired of in two weeks. And I had no idea at all about the richness of what was here. For me, it started out, I think, as it does for lots of people, as an exercise, a very physical path. And in fact, when we asked Mr. Moy about meditation and the spiritual side, he basically said, oh, you guys should just do Danyus for a few years and get into your bodies. And in those days, he really implied, and well, said very clearly that most Western people live too much in their heads and too much in theory and that what we all needed was to get grounded. I guess that's one of the things that I have really loved about the way things have developed is that as we've learned more about the, the philosophy and the spiritual tradition of Taoism, it's always very much rooted. You've got your feet on the ground even though you're looking toward the clouds sometimes. There's always a very clear physical correspondence. It, it's not as if it's something made up, but you can feel it in your own body and in your own experience, and that makes it very real and, and very vital. We practice all these uh, alchemy techniques, although it sounds a little bit uh, esoteric. But and the goal really is to, at the, I guess, at the first step, is really to uh, achieve better health for yourself. And while you're achieving this better health for yourself, you can, along the way, you can help people with poorer health than you. It goes very much with the aims of the Feng Lai Kok, which is trying to make the world a better place. And this is, of course, basic to the philosophy of Taoism, too, that what we're really here for is to help other people, and that one of the ways we help and cultivate ourselves is by letting go of our own self-interest and really turning toward other people and trying to help them. I don't have much to add. I'm still teaching meditation. Hopefully, from meditation, people can cultivate their body and their heart to do good deeds sincerely, so as to benefit humanity. Thank you.